Hello and welcome to the latest Science of Sport podcast. I'm your host, Matt Solomon, and today I'm delighted to be joined by James DeLacy. So James is a strength and conditioning coach and the owner of Lift Big, Eat Big and the Sweet Science of Fighting. He's an expert in martial art and combat sports, and that makes him the perfect person today to discuss how you can improve your grappling performance. So without further ado, it's time to welcome James onto the show. So James, welcome to the Science of Sport podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. All right, thank you for having me on. I think this is, is this number four? Or number five? Four or five, something like that. You've, you've been on yeah. a few times. You knock around a little bit. So uh, no, I really yeah, appreciate I you uh, coming back. I come off the bench yeah. when you need me on. So. Come in, coach. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. So um, we're going we're gonna to chat about grappling and um, some combat sports stuff. But can you give us a quick introduction as to who you are and what you're up to? Yeah, for sure. So I spend most of my time working in professional international rugby and rugby league until the pandemic moved fully online now i've just i'm kind of geared more towards uh combat sports as the main thing uh, that's pretty much all combat sports so i have sweet science of fighting.com that has a bunch of training programs and things like that got a couple of professional mma fighters running through that currently uh actually had a jiu-jitsu athlete last year i think when pan ams for her respected belt level uh running those programs too so just basically doing strength conditioning online uh, like that so yeah mainly get towards combat sports there hence what we're talking about today absolutely excellent so obviously like i, I want to talk about grappling sports and and like the physical requirements of that and how you then train for it but before we get into it can you talk us through what grappling is and what that then yeah. means in terms of grappling sports yeah grappling is pretty catch-all term i mean even sports like rugby have elements of grappling stuff into it but we can just define it as, as simply like uh combat sports that are that use grappling wrestling jiu-jitsu uh judo to an extent as well uh sports that don't have a striking element to them so yeah i mean we can mainly focus on i think jiu-jitsu and wrestling are probably the easiest ones just to kind of focus on if we're going to stick with strength conditioning for grappling just because they're relatively similar since they have elements of both uh judo is a little different piece ah your colleague is better for judo than me he's actually he actually did the, what, the judo program on sweet times of fighting too so He's yeah, the man shout for out that. to Casper for that. Yeah, um, mate. So, obviously, a uh, quick shout out to Casper for all of those uh, great things as well. And he's been on the podcast too, so we'll link that one in. Um, but then, what what are the physical requirements for this? Right. So, if I'm going to go and grapple against someone, maybe I'm twice the size of that person, but they're probably going to win, right? So, why why yeah. is that person then better than someone potentially bigger than them? Yeah, the, it's interesting. Now, if you look back at some of the jujitsu, re- there's like. Wait, can I swear on this again? I can't remember now. <laughs> you can. We're just gonna we're just gonna like uh, put it on uh, YouTube where uh, where it's not for kids. It's fine. Okay, sweet. Yeah, there's sweet fuck all research on <clears throat> in jujitsu. A lot of it's really old, and obviously because it's quite old, it's usually done in the gi. And <laughs> with the way modern jujitsu is going now, it's a lot of a lot of no gi and a lot of changes with the with the rule set. So originally, a lot of that old research in jujitsu looked at uh very long work times with very short rest times uh concluding it was kind of more of say quote unquote aerobic sport obviously now with the rule sets being more no gi so without the gi or without the kimono for um anyone who's not familiar it's a little more wrestling based a lot of the rule sets so you have those um, big events like adcc and a lot of other submission grappling events that uh encourage a lot more wrestling a lot more stand-up and so the sports become a little more, I guess, higher intensity, I guess you could say, within that. So obviously you have your mixed element. Well, this is why I quite like combat sports because it's so similar to sports, you know, other team sports, right? Like mixed sports that have requirements from all three energy systems, strength, power, speed, etc. So you have all those, but you tend to have an isometric element on top of it uh, more so than other sports just because you're having to hold and manipulate other opponents' legs, arms, all that kind of stuff. So if we're talking pure just strength and conditioning, yeah, that you pretty much have everything, just with maybe a little more isometric emphasis. Or if you wanted to go down physiology, you, you might have a more of a peripheral or muscular you know, muscular endurance, quote unquote, emphasis uh than other sports. And and the, how is it then different to other sports? Because obviously there's things like no running, for example. So is is yeah. there is there like a a difference in how that physiology then manifests because obviously they're not doing um i don't know 2500 meters of high intensity running like you would in in football or soccer right yeah correct so most of the stuff you're 
most of the stuff you're doing on the mats, but obviously, like with all sports, you're going to be doing some stuff outside of actual training if you're targeting certain physiological qualities around that. Like, uh, just to come back to the, the previous one as well, I forgot to mention as well, kind of thinking of it on a spectrum with other combat sports. So grappling would be seen as more of, say, a strength-dominant martial art or combat sport. Your striking arts like boxing, kickboxing, would be seen more of kind of like a velocity or speed dominant. And then you kind of have like MMA right in the middle <laughs> as a hybrid. So your strength training, or for your, so your overall strength conditioning for grappling tends to be more orientated to maximal strength bodybuilding style now that's not to say all of it should be and etc i mean i think a lot of people have probably talked about uh varying philosophies around strength conditioning i know mine is touching on all qualities all the time and that means within a training program even if it's geared towards strength and hypertrophy you're still gonna have some kind of uh, power development speed development in there um and regarding the, the no running yeah i mean running is seen as synonymous with combat sports it's like if you don't run you're gonna suck which is quite funny but again it's just you know, it's, it's a mode of training to develop whatever the physiological quality is you're trying to do. And there are other ways of doing it, you know, rowing machine, bike, uh, solo drills on the mat, solo wrestling, partner drills, one-to-one. -one. Like I had I put my heart rate monitor on in class one day just to, um, just to show what a class can look like. And we were just doing partner drills, I think one-on-one and, one and two and two. So I do two techniques and the other person does two. And you can see my heart rate kind of just waving up and down in, in that. I can't even remember the colors on polar man. Whatever the lower colors are, green and stuff, green and yellow, okay. or... blue, blue, then green, then yeah. yellow, orange, and red. It was basically like blue, green, yellowish uh, through there. So you're getting a lot of if you're doing a lot of the sport itself, you're getting a lot of that lower end, and then you're just kind of attacking that higher, uh, higher end off the mass typically, because um, your yeah, sparring can be intense, but it's a little more unpredictable. And. Obviously, like, are there any kind of specific things that need to be trained alongside that? Because I imagine uh, if I go and run all day, every day, like great aerobic uh, base, awesome. Um, I can do some intervals, so maybe I've got some anaerobic stuff going on there, but then, like, no grip strength. So, you mm. know, weak hands, they don't do anything. <laughs> like, well, um, uh, is, is that, like, a limiting factor? Is there, is there some stuff that needs to be trained extra and more specifically compared to, um, for example, other sports? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, grip neck is kind of like uh, the badge for for combat athletes. Sure, that that stuff will help as well. I think I'm lucky enough where I get to talk to a lot of different PhD researchers and coaches in combat sports on on my podcast as well on Sweet Science of Fighting, and there's a lot of really good research and theories out now regarding peripheral adaptations being the limiting factor, not so much central. Uh, at least in some of these cohorts, and I know. Uh, I, have you had Andrew Usher on? On here yet? Not, no. Okay, no. I'll link you guys up. He's doing some uh, epic stuff within within boxing, and he's the papers he's published recently, and at least to his cohort of professional boxers, it's not the they're not centrally limited. It's the fact that their muscles don't recover between rounds that is holding them back, and you can develop that ability or improve that ability through more, I guess you could say, peripherally targeted uh, conditioning, which would be kind of like sprint intervals that that he's developed. I know I talked to another coach um, and he, his theory is the same thing. A lot of athletes come in and they're kind of, oh, I don't want to throw random words around, but like peripherally underdone as, as a sense where it's not gassing out because, because of the central uh, limitations. It's gassing out just because the muscles end up not being able to uh, contract and, and produce force, et cetera. So those things are, uh, things to address typically and i think and sports like grappling do have a high peripheral demand because again as we mentioned a lot of the isometric work uh, is done within the sport itself so yeah i mean sprint sprint intervals is, is one thing that people can do uh and then there's stuff you can do in the gym as well like i think mo most people are probably familiar with like various tempo methods um to develop like oxidative capacity there within fast twitch muscle fibers and things you can kind of control the tempo of the eccentric and concentric kind of do something continuously that's something you can do there as well even uh what was it escalating density tra training edt where you're doing like one rep then of like a squat then one rep of a bench and going for like five minutes or something like that that could be something that's um beneficial as well but typically within i know i'm going i'm just continuing to talk here so just jump in wherever <laughs> but even going <laughs> into the gym like for the strength training side there's some things that i really like to do because i think a lot of people 
a lot of I've, i hear this all the time as well like oh i stopped going to the gym or i stopped strength training because i feel uh tired and i feel stiff and i'm sore all the time and stuff and it's like yeah probably because you blasted chest for 20 sets and you tried to come to the gym to roll like no wonder you feel like shit um so one of the things i've i've got a lot of my programs that i use a lot of cluster sets um in there because one it's a novel stimulus for most people so that's like instant gains and then two obviously you reduce the residual fatigue because you're fresher doing these reps um and that's not to say that it's superior to traditional sets because if you look at the the research on cluster training like traditional sets and cluster sets seem to elicit similar um responses long term to strength and uh power but interestingly cluster sets seem to have well, seem to be most beneficial during ballistic exercise so like jump squats etc so i use that for those but i also use it for the strength exercises just like only for the residual fatigue um i'll say issue that can arise if you're doing a lot of strength training and a lot of grappling obviously if you're only like you know grappling or wrestling three times a week then it's a different story but for people who are wanting to do more and compete and stuff yeah there's some some things that you can change and is there anything else in the gym? Because that was, that was my next question. You kind of answered it already, which is great. But like, oh, what, nice. what can people then do in the gym to, to improve their grappling performance? So clusters might be a, a great example, especially when they've got a high training load. But yeah, there, yeah. are there any other things in the gym that you think oh, that could really target A, B or C to, to bring their performance up a level? Yeah, my my personal preference for grappling arts, I, I love the Olympic weightlifting derivatives. Like I, in rugby, I barely use them. I use them every now and then, but hardly ever. But probably now i'll probably use them more if i was going back in there but for yeah for grapplers love it it's just like it hits everything with that one exercise so you're able to for my favorite ones are typically like a snatch high pull um clean high pull to an extent but um various clean pulls floating clean pulls and floating snatch pulls so if anyone who's not familiar so uh snatch high pull and clean high pull would just be like doing a normal pull but then you're kind of pulling the bar up as high as you can at the top with the shrug the floating versions uh you're doing the clean pull and then you're lowering it back down, but you're not letting it touch the floor. So you're having to reverse it. So you're having to hold the bar for the like all five reps kind of thing. Um, and those overload your upper back and stuff massively. So I love those. I also really like those um, those high pulls as well, because again, they don't exactly replicate. For example, if you're getting your hips in, you've got someone's back when you're standing and you're going for some kind of mat return to lift the opponent, but it gets pretty damn close uh, with the action which is really nice um to get even closer and what's even nicer is using sandbags a huge i've got two sandbags in the garage i love them man those are good fun um one thing i've been playing around with a lot is sandbag loading <clears throat> so it gets you in those awkward positions bent over like quote unquote awkward strength uh, i think is probably underdone as well within grappling because a lot of it's spent doing traditional kind of like powerlifting bodybuilding programs which i think uh not beneficial at all for grappling out sure if you're a complete beginner in the gym go ahead but once you get past that stage health and bodybuilding programs make no sense um, why, but, why is that the case before we before we move on to something really yeah. interesting in a second why, why do you think that's the case so tr typically your powerlifting and bodybuilding programs are lacking or have too much and are lacking in certain things so typically they have too much volume um, so you're doing like five sets of five this then five sets of five that like try doing five sets of five of squats and then deadlifts and bench whatever else you're doing on there plus accessories and then going to go train it's you know powerlifting programs are built for powerlifters to get stronger in the power lifts whereas you know when you're training for grappling you're you're trained still to get generally stronger in most cases but you're doing it in a way where you can still do your other technical training powerlifting technical training is done in the gym um obviously with body most bodybuilding programs you're kind of targeting muscle groups so you're doing a lot of volume in one area before going to the gym and you're typically doing more days of training and then obviously you're missing out on a huge range of various movements. Like you don't really have any rotation in a bodybuilding or powerlifting program, as an example. Um, you don't have any jumps and plyometrics and things like that or throws. I mean, you can add them in, but they're typically not there if you're running a traditional program like that. So yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge fan. I usually steer people away from it. I usually steer people away from yeah traditional bodybuilding powerlifting programs into something that that touches on everything. So for example, starting the program, you're doing some kind of jumps uh, or plyometrics or throws and the intensity will depend on where you are in your training, etc. Then you might do something that's slightly loaded, more to, more towards like a loaded power development kind of thing. And then you might go into your heavier stuff and then you might go into your more accessory style stuff if you need it. So it makes a little more sense that way. 
And obviously, that's then like the the gym structure. Is there is there a certain number of times per week, for example? Like, do they need to be doing um, power every day, or does it need to be um, like aerobic stuff, balance with the strength stuff? How would you structure those different training sessions to match the the grappling as well? So I usually advocate two to three times a week of strength training for for grapplers. It kind of depends on. Um, you know, guys who want to put on size or guys who are just kind of looking to get stronger or depends how much they're doing their grappling. So within my programs, I usually have two to three. One of those, I usually like to go, if it's three, I like to have like one day is like almost like a bodybuilding accessory style day. So it's almost like a lower day of training, but um, it's not as uh, taxing, I guess you could say on the joint stuff. Cause anyone who does any kind of martial art will kind of know, like after a session, you know, you can, you can be pretty beat up even the next day, especially if it's a harder one. So a lighter bodybuilding style session kind of makes sense in that regard. But yeah, the, the two days are there. Um, I usually like to now stack a, I guess you call like an alactic power session directly after one of the days. So for example, the first day you might do your <clears throat> full body strength power stuff, and then you'll go straight on to say a bike and you might do like six to 10 second sprints with full rest. Um, and obviously that risk can decrease if you may be getting closer to competition, et cetera. But, um, and then a, a separate day might be done on its own just for some extra conditioning if you need it. I mean, if you're in the gym six times a week doing jujitsu, fuck, like good luck finding some more time. Most, there's no, there aren't many full-time grapplers um, making a living doing this. So obviously people have family and work and stuff like that. Hence why tacking it on after strength training works well for most people. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much how I've done it. It's how a lot of my members seem to like how that's going now obviously people try and counter things like oh the interference effect and blah 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 but you know we know from recent research the interference effect isn't such a bad or big thing and if interference effect and the concurrent and concurrent training was such a problem like you know from all the athletes you train if, if it was such a problem no team sport athletes crossfit athletes would have any muscle or any strength because all they do is concurrent training every damn day of the week uh, so yeah i wouldn't say it's that much of a problem I think uh, that makes a lot of sense, and yeah, especially when it comes to to like managing the the physical demands in the sense of um, how much they can actually deal with, so that you're not just like st- like getting this massive addition and addition and addition of yeah. training load. So you're like not on one day you go, all right, I'm going to do an hour and a half of bodybuilding, then I'm going to go and wrestle, and the next day I'm going to go and do another hour and a half of bodybuilding, mm-hmm. and then I'm going to do and wrestle, and then all of a sudden after three days you're completely dead. <laughs> like, I, will, I will say though, grappling is like at least from personal experience, is one of the martial arts that you can strength train beforehand and not have such a uh, problem going to technical training versus something okay. else. It's just, I don't know, they just pair really well. Obviously, I'm not talking about going, and as I mentioned, doing like 20 sets of chest and then going to train. I mean, like, if you're doing like a, just, even if you're doing just a basic strength training routine, maybe you're like doing something minimal, like you're doing front squats, uh, I don't know, dumbbell bench and some rows or something like that. It tends to pair well with uh jujitsu training as long as you're not doing stupid volumes i think that's a good little addition as well so when when it comes to bringing this all together obviously like, i'm interested to hear what a session with you might look like so can you walk us through what a session in the gym might look like if you're going to improve a, a grappler's performance yeah for sure so it obviously depends on what they want i kind of mentioned the session structure a little earlier so it'll pretty much be similar to that so if it's like someone newer who most Grapplers don't really have a, a lifting background. Okay, I won't say most because it's a lot of lifters now going into combat sports. Um, but I will say a lot of them don't have a background in, I guess you could say, more athletic tasks like jumping and, and plyometrics and stuff like that. So it would typically be doing some kind of uh, extensive or submaximal jump and plyometric circuits. I'm a huge fan of those. I actually got those from Nick Garcia. Um, if anyone's familiar with him, he has some awesome jump circuits that I've kind of just modified for my own. And it's basically, you're doing a shit ton of ground contacts and jumps. Like in one set, you're doing uh, probably like 90 ground contacts in one set. And you might do, depending on where you're on the week, you might do like two or three sets of it. But you're essentially just doing like submaximal smooth rhythmic, like squat jumps, ankle pops, you know, lateral squat jumps, that kind of stuff. You can mix it up and do single leg versions. You can do rotational versions. But that's just to prepare the body for, you know, more intense work later down the line. So I'm a big fan of those. Um, another way, and some of my work capacity blocks I've gotten in my training app, I've I've used uh, Vern Gambetta's leg circuit, which is so brutal. Have you done that? Have you done a leg <laughs> circuit before? 
dude, we start, we, me and my wife would be like, oh yeah, let's just do it when we're in, uh, we we're stuck in lockdown. And we just started doing that, dude. That's like the hardest thing. Even the regressions are like stupid hard. Eventually, the goal is you want to be able to do five rounds of bodyweight squats uh, times 20, one every second, uh, just lunges, <clears throat> forward lunges uh, times 20, and then step ups times 20, and then 10 uh, like jump squats, bodyweight, five rounds, no rest. That is like the goal. And then the idea is that once you can do that, you're like ready for like everything else. But dude, try just doing like one and a half rounds of that. Even the regressions with rest are stupid hard. Um, so that's something you can do for like work capacity wise as well. <clears throat> but anyway, back to the the session. So it might be some kind of um, jump plyometric circuit to get them prepared. It might be some throws in there depending after that. And then if they if they were ready for more intense plyometric jump activities, then we'll probably include something uh, some kind of jumping stuff. But from there. It would be then into some kind of loaded uh, full-ish body power stuff. So it could be um, typically at that stage, it might be one of the weightlifting derivatives. So, you know, hang snatch high pull or floating clean pull or something kind of covers both that strength and, and power stuff. And then it might be into uh, a heavier lower body movement, single leg, double leg, whatever. I'm not too fussed in terms of uh, a lot of the exercise selection, just kind of cover it. Same with the push, same with the pull. And then if there's time or depending on what else is going on, because that's still a relatively quick session. It could be some uh, grip work at the end there. Uh, I will say neck stuff is pretty important and that usually goes in the warm up or superset it with your main work. So if you're just doing squats, you can superset that with neck if you've got the space there. I'm a big, uh, a big fan of the iron neck. I have <clears throat> that in the garage. That's the only thing that makes my neck feel damn good. So I'll use that as well. But yeah, and then obviously uh off topic or kind of on topic just that you've got an extra fly in the garage so i'm going to set that up after this and get on the flywheel because yeah that shit is is uh very very nice so what what to talk talk us through that flywheel training then what's uh what does yeah. that look like for you so uh, i think most of us most of listeners should be familiar with it but it's just like a, a large disc on a axle that rotates it's kind of like a yo-yo right the strap comes up and it comes down um the idea Okay, there's a few advantages of flywheel training and just a quick rundown. Like, So what you put into it concentrically is what it gives back eccentrically, so it's always even. So if you're giving maximal reps concentrically, it'll give you maximal reps eccentrically. And then as you fatigue concentrically, the eccentric matches. So it ends up being relatively safe. It also means every rep you do is maximal. Whereas if you're doing a squat with 70% 1RM, it's not until like the last, I don't know, night. 10th 9th or 10th whatever it is rep um it really becomes maximal so you get maximal reps on every uh every squat you do uh, there's no dead spots on it so a dead spot for example in a squat it's easy at the top and hard at the bottom so once you get past that sticking point it becomes relatively easy whereas on the flywheel it's hard all the way down uh so you get a huge i guess you could say uh eccentric load there and then obviously one of the arguments people will say is you know if people say flywheels are good for eccentric overload but that doesn't make sense right if i'm saying it's equally eccentric to concentric but you can manipulate the way you do the eccentric phase to eccentrically overload like instead of resisting from the top like quickly drop down to halfway and then resist only the bottom half so you get that huge spike and that peak eccentric force just from the second half um, as an example two up one down is another one there's a there's a bunch of them you can overspeed the concentric by using your hands um, or you can use the eccentric motor that Exafly has. This is not an advertisement, by the way. I just really fucking like the thing, and I'm just going <laughs> to set it up in a bit. But the eccentric motor is, is legit as. Um, so you can essentially set it to boost the eccentric phase by 10 to 80% more than you do concentrically. So if you're doing uh, if you're doing every rep concentrically 100%, then you're going to get an extra 10% eccentric boost or whatever. And I wouldn't go over 30% because holy shit, that thing is brutal. It's going to um, suck in and, and uh, end up on the floor. Yeah, exactly. Um, but funnily enough, from uh, anecdotally and from a, a few other people have been saying the same thing, like it doesn't give the same soreness that uh, barbell training does. Like you can overload eccentrically hard on a flywheel and you're not going to have the same soreness the next day uh, as you would if you're doing like 110% 1RM eccentric squat, which is quite interesting uh, in terms of applications. Like, I've done some pretty brutal sets on the thing before. Yeah. I just like wasn't sore, uh, which is, yeah, that might be a unique thing to the, 
to the flywheel itself. But yeah, there's a lot of things you can do with it. It's a pretty cool piece of uh, kit that I think more, especially individual athletes, because it's easier to use individual setting than a team setting, um, that more people should definitely look to use. And is that something that you recommend for grapplers as well then? There's like an accessory yeah. potentially for their, for the strength work? Yeah, 100%. 100%. It's just like, you can, dude, you get a mad arm pump if you're doing kills on that thing too. Because there's like no that's sticking what, point. That's what we're interested in, mate. Don't yeah, worry about doing arms. squats on it. We just want arms. <laughs> hey, arms are important for grapplers, right? you got to be able to, uh, <laughs> to sink chokes and hold people. So, yeah, for, yeah. for real, though, so doing like, doing curls on that thing is, is another level. It's, it's pretty cool. But um, overall, yeah, for the different adaptations you can get out of it, for how easy it is to use, like one piece of equipment, you can cover most of your bases with it. It kind of it makes sense in, in a lot of settings. Obviously, traditional weight training is uh, always good to do, but this is just something else that people can do. Um, it can potentially even be a replacement for you know, traditional barbell training, especially people with beat up joints and stuff like that, like knees, shoulders, all that kind of stuff. You can kind of uh, work around that a bit with the flywheel. Absolutely excellent, mate. So um, in terms of like where people can find more information about you and what you're up to, where's the best place to, to reach out? Uh, sweetscienceoffighting.com you can find the YouTube channels, podcast everything there uh, also have liftbigeatbig.com which is more geared towards strength sports uh, I do that one with my wife there, that's like weightlifting, strongman general fitness stuff as well but yeah, if anyone's interested in combat sports yeah, sweetscienceoffighting.com is the place I think that's everything, I don't really use I use my personal social handles and stuff like, only to really like look at stuff, not to really post <laughs> so, so the other places are probably better excellent mate so massive thanks for your time and effort today it's been a pleasure talking and I look forward to speaking again soon cheers mate appreciate it cheers buddy and that's it once again a massive thanks to James for all of his hard work on today's podcast I really appreciate it and I'm sure you do at home too before you leave I want to point you in the direction of the Science of Sport Coach Academy the Coach Academy is an overgrowing library of sports science courses which are broken down into bite-sized chunks so if you enjoyed today's podcast and you want to get your hands on some more great sports science information, all you have to do is hit the link in the show notes and you can get in there completely for free for the next seven days. So hit that link in just a few seconds time. And if you have enjoyed today's podcast, it'd be fantastic if you could recommend us to a coach, a colleague, an athlete, or a friend. That means that we can keep bringing the best possible guests and the best possible content. And that's it. Once again, a massive thanks from me. I'm Matt Solomon for Science Sport and I'll speak to you next week.